Hey, this is Mark at the Clawson Comic Book and Toy Show. I'm here with promoter, showrunner, Marty Hershek. How you doing, bud? I'm okay. How are you, Mark? I'm doing great. Tell me, um, with all the shows popping up these days, what makes this show different than the rest? This show, for a small show, we invite artists, guests at every single one, which is, you know, something that you would expect at a larger show. So I'm trying to bring a piece of that to the smaller shows, artists and writers, creators. You know, next year we're going to expand, try to get some other celebrity types involved, but people totally involved in comics and toys. And that's really all it's ever going to be is a comic and toy show. Although this time around I brought the newspapers for JFK. It's the 59th anniversary of the assassination. So the tie-in with comics with the newspapers is the Sunday comic section, which um, I've been fortunate over the years collecting these things, and that was kind of one of my goals, was to get all the seven-day newspaper strips of the comics during the week of the assassination. I notice you carry a lot of original art, unlike a lot of other dealers here who just have like the newer stuff. Tell us a little bit about some of this original art. Okay, so the original art I've collected over the years uh, runs from the 1940s to the present, Golden Age, Silver Age, uh, underground comics, independent comics. I wanted to get a little bit of everything because I was doing art shows featuring comic art, which we've done them in Dearborn and Pontiac, Michigan, and a couple other locations. But uh, my larger goal with art and comics in general is to create a show that has an educational standpoint to it beyond just coming through the door and buying and selling comics. That's, that's obviously a big part of the show, but adding an educational component to it is important to me. So that's why I bring the art and the newspapers and things like that. Now, I know you're a beast at promoting the show. You see these signs everywhere. Tell us a little bit what, what some of the you know, pros and cons of trying to get the word out for the show. Okay, uh, yeah, a lot of driving, a lot of walking, a lot of talking to people, a lot of everything, just nonstop, just promoting all the time. You know, and then, you know, realistically, you got to say there's lots of other shows in the Midwest. So we're not in competition with them, we're in cooperation with them. We want these people to come to this show as well, and I go to their shows, and we all cross-pollinate one another's collector's shows in the end, it ends up being one big happy family of collectors and dealers that are working together for the ultimate goal of all filling out our collections, which is really, you know, the main reason for being here is we're all kind of like fanatics, basically, when it comes to comics and toys. I personally come to a lot of shows, and I see here you bring in a lot of the, the elite dealers from the area to your show. It tells you a little bit about your credibility. I really appreciate that, and you're right. These dealers here are serious. They're committed. They're really organized. You're not going to come here and be tripping over boxes and, you know, scattered junk on the floor and things like that. These these guys really know what they're doing. It's and I'm I'm proud of the way they present themselves. The the displays are beautiful, really nice stuff. You're also, I want to get into your little bit of your history, you're also a comic book creator. Tell us a little bit about that and some of the work that you've done. I started uh, drawing homemade comics in the middle 1970s. My first one was Superbug in 1975, made on loose leaf paper. And then from there, I just kept drawing and drawing more in comics and writing them. I finally got published in a fanzine in 1992 which was dedicated to Steve Ditko's career. It was called Ditko Mania. From there, I ended up doing independent comics and also tried to get hired at Marvel, DC, and MAD, and that never happened, but along the way, meeting those editors was great. Whether I got hired or not didn't matter to me because I met the people I really admired as creators and publishers of comics. So that would include Stan Lee, Carmine Infantino, uh, several of the underground publishers that were independent back then, like um, Dennis Kitchen. And honestly, it's in the hundreds of people that have got to work with in fanzines and comics in the last 35, 40 years, actually. So. Do you still dabble in the drawing comics? or? I, I still do a little bit. Uh, like right now, my most recent work is the posters for these shows, which... 
all of that is based on comic art and lettering. Like the comic book lettering is so unique that most people don't realize it because they're reading the story. They don't realize how beautiful the lettering is done. It's easy to read because it's so well done. And that's one part of comics I've always enjoyed was the, the creators of these lettering fonts. You know, they're like Artie Simek at Marvel Comics, Joe Rosen. Um, there was a guy at ETC, um, I think his name was Ira something. I can't remember at the moment, but in the 60s, he was, he was great. Very, very super clean work. John Romita Sr. had commented once in an interview, he said how beautiful the DC line art was, that he described them as the Cadillac of comics in the 1950s, which they were. They were very streamlined, very clean. They almost didn't need the comics code to approve their books because everything was geared towards a clean um, readership anyway. So there was never really any underground components with DC Comics until the early 1970s with Green Lantern when they did the speedy drug issues, which came after the Spider-Man drug issues. You know, Stan Lee kind of broke the ground with that. And I had said it before, and I'll say it again, that I believe the underground comics had a big influence on overground comics. They were getting away with everything in undergrounds and never used the comics code where DC and Marvel had to. And at one point, Stan Lee just said, why do we have to do this? You know, I want to tell this story. Whether it's code approved or not, I'm going to tell the story. And he did. And it changed comics. In 1972, they relaxed the restrictions on comic books. So then the floodgates opened up where Marvel and DC could start doing horror again, which for the longest time it was banned and more likely to be found on the magazine rack, you know, from people like James Warren, eerie, creepy, things like that. Um, the comic history is interesting. It's very deep. It goes back to the 1890s with the Yellow Kid. By the time the Golden Age came around, comics were well entrenched in America with the newspapers. And the four-color comics coming out back then from 1938 on with Superman debuting in action number one, that created an atmosphere of almost hysteria to where people are collecting these things because so many were chewed up and thrown into the paper mills during the paper drives of World War II and the 1950s and 60s. You know, I personally was there in the 60s and 70s to watch metric tons of comics and newspapers being shredded for the purpose of recycling. You know, I was in the Cub Scouts, and that was what we used to call them back then, called the paper drives. So we would collect newspapers and comics, and they were all going to the paper mill to be shredded, to be turned into more comics and papers. Kind of like how the junkyard is with cars. Crush them, melt them, make another car, you know. Well, this was quite an educational history about comics, Marty. Anyways, if, if you anyone wants to get out and come to a great show, come and check out the Clawson Comic Book and Toy Show. Go to all your socials. You'll find us. You'll find it linked to our social media, and it's all over the place because Marty does one hell of a job at promoting. So come to the show, and this is Mark with Comic Experience Sci-Fi. <laughs>